Welcome to another edition of RCE. Again, this is Brock Palin. You can find us online at rce-cast.com. You can also find links to all of our Twitters and the blogs and stuff like that. Uh, you can also find the complete back catalog there and a link to an RSS feed. I also have with me, again, Jeff Squires from Cisco Systems and one of the authors of OpenMPI. Jeff, thanks a lot for your time. Sure, Brock. How's it going? All right. It's been a while since we've done one of these. Yeah, so uh, I think by the time we get this one out, uh, people will either have, have just submitted their XC papers or they're, they're, or they're still frantically working on it, depending on plus or minus a day or two when we, when we get this out. Yeah, the Exceed 15 technical paper deadline is March 30th, and we're recording this on uh, March 23rd. So we'll we'll see if this even gets on the air in time for people to even realize Some, Sometime that. right around then. All right, well, what do we got today, Brock? So today uh, we have something that we've been talking about around our shop, um, and so we finally just decided we should find out more about it. So today we're going to be talking to um, Mike Place, who's one of the creators of SaltStack. So uh, Mike, why don't you take a moment to introduce yourself? Yeah, hey Brock and Jeff, it's uh, it's really good to be with you. I appreciate you having me on. Uh, yeah, I'm on the uh, the engineering team uh, here at SaltStack. Uh, I have been here uh, about 18 months. Uh, I was the fourth or fifth uh, engineer hired here, and uh, we're we're growing very rapidly. Uh, so we no longer have a a very tiny engineering team. We only we now have uh, just a a relatively small engineering team. But, uh, yeah, like I said, I've been here uh, about 18 months. Uh, I've got uh, uh, going on uh, what, what almost looks like uh, 20 years of experience, terrifyingly enough, going back to uh, the mid-90s uh, when, I, when I worked at uh, little indie ISPs around here and, uh, and then uh, spent some time over at Novell. And, uh, and now I'm here having a good time, uh, one of those lucky people that gets paid to write open source software, and uh, it does, really doesn't get much better than that. Okay, so we're specifically going to be talking about SaltStack. So uh, give us the one paragraph. What is SaltStack? Sure. SaltStack is a uh, remote execution and uh, configuration management platform. And uh, so uh, most people know us uh, for the configuration management piece, uh, but we're actually a much larger systems management uh, uh, piece of software than, than simply config management. So to, to start with configuration management, most people know the major players uh, in that space. That's folks like uh, Chef and Puppet, uh, CF Engine, uh, and, and us. Uh, and so configuration management, uh, for those who don't know, uh, is, is simply the idea that uh, you can uh, manage the configuration on your systems uh, in a stateful manner so that you can uh, uh, either declaratively or imperatively uh, declare the intended state of your systems, uh, and then either with a single command or with a small set of commands, uh, enforce that state uh, across, of course, either a single system uh, or many tens or hundreds of thousands of, of machines all at once. Uh, beyond that, uh, SaltStack is, uh, is a remote execution platform. Uh, uh, so because uh, we have uh, mas uh, masters and then we have agents running on on large numbers of machines, uh, people who want to do things like, for example, uh, patch a security hole uh, can do so uh, with uh, with simply a single command uh, and make sure that uh, uh, that that's done uh, across many many servers. Now, just out of curiosity, further distinguish for this for me because uh, mm -hmm. the other sure. configuration management systems also have at least some flavor of remote execution. Um, mm -hmm. Built into them, if nothing else, you know, just pure SSH execution, these kinds of things. What sure. makes SaltStack different? One of the things that makes SaltStack the most different is that uh, is that we focus very, very heavily uh, on remote execution performance. Uh, we're well known for uh, using uh, a high-speed messaging bus. Uh, we've started out uh, with zero MQ uh, under the hood. Uh, that allows us to scale very, very rapidly. Um, and so while many other configuration managements may have a rem remote execution uh, component to them, uh, we're very, very focused uh, on the performance piece of that component uh, to, uh, to allow um, remote execution to tr truly scale. And that opens up a lot of really interesting possibilities that you just don't have if you have uh, a slower transport under the hood. So when you said uh, parallel execution, you're talking mm -hmm. about 
not like serially running a thing on a node at a time. You're not talking parallel processing, which is what a lot of our listeners are familiar with. That's right. Yeah, we're not talking parallel processing. We're talking uh, parallel execution. Uh, the idea that uh, from uh, a a single manager node, uh, one can uh, issue a command uh, that is run uh, simultaneously or near simultaneously uh, across a large number of uh, agent machines. Okay, so how does this compare to something like Kickstart? Like, can you actually take a machine from bare metal, or do you rely on something else for that? Right. Um, we we uh, normally exist in, uh, in the virtualization and, and containerization uh, space. Uh, we have done uh, some uh, bare metal work uh, in the past. Um, the uh, we, we aren't particularly focused on that. Most of the time, uh, we, we pick things up uh, after an operating system uh, has been provisioned. That said, uh, we do have a... Um, uh, a piece of software uh, called Salt Cloud, and uh, Salt Cloud is designed uh, t to uh, bring systems up uh, either in public clouds or private clouds, uh, or uh, you know near to bare metal, uh, simply with with hypervisors uh, on the ground. Okay, so you said something very interesting there. You said a slower transport. Now, what do you what do you mean by that? Because I'm a networking guy. I work for Cisco. Sure. Um, transport has a very specific meaning to me, but I think you're, you're talking about something a little more general than that. Sure. Sure. Um, so we've, we've done a lot of work actually, uh, on the transport layer because we find, uh, that it impacts performance, uh, so heavily, uh, when I'm talking about transport and when most, um, uh, people who are in the space are talking about transport, they're talking about the difference between, um, uh, say SSH as a transport uh, versus HTTP as a transport uh, versus uh, for us, like I said, uh, zero MQ uh, just running over TCP. Uh, and uh, we may get into this a little bit later, uh, but one of uh, our efforts over the past year uh, has actually been to introduce a new transport uh, that we call RATE, the uh, Reliable Asynchronous Event Transport. Uh, which is a uh, reliable transport that we have built uh, on top of UDP, and uh, oh, that it's, sounds... it's de yeah, it's designed uh, it's designed uh, both to be used with Salt uh, or potentially uh, on its own, and uh, and like I said, we've we've done a lot of uh, of development work in that area, and so we're very excited about it. All right, now that sounds actually pretty sexy to me. So you have yeah. your own little daemons running. Uh, either on top of a VM or in VMs and things like that for sending these kinds of control messages around? That's how rate is used? Right. Well, SALT is used, um, you know, most commonly, uh, like I said, in a, uh, a master agent mode. Uh, we call our agents uh, minions, uh, you know, from Despicable Me, <laughs> uh, the movie, for those who have seen it. And um, so... We have agents running on uh, on all of these minions. Uh, those agents can are uh, they connect back uh, to the master, and uh, they simply listen uh, for commands which are published, and then they act upon them. Uh, and those commands can be, like we said, something as simple as remote execution, or something as complex as uh, enforcing uh, an intended state uh, that uh, from the configuration management layer. Uh, laying down you know, new packages or new configuration files or ensuring that those configuration files are in a given state uh, on a system, so on and so forth. Uh, and so that's the basic idea of what's happening. Of course, we build quite a bit on top of that, uh, but that's fundamentally what's on the ground. Now, you mentioned you, you uh, have spent a lot of time in, in terms of scalability and whatnot. Can you explain how that's affected as well? I mean, do you have a a hierarchical kind of connectivity or a mesh-like connectivity or, or something other than linear? Or does linear just, when done well, scale out really well? How, how do you do that? Right. So, you know, we believe uh, that, uh, you know, performance really comes uh, from making good architectural decisions. Uh, for us, um, especially in the beginning, uh, using 0MQ um, has been a really good architectural decision for us. Um, and so what we're able to do is uh, using 0MQ, uh, uh, we have a, a push-pull pattern um, between uh, the uh, masters and the minions. Uh, and so the uh, 
uh, zero MQ uh, is uh, effectively threaded under the hood. And so what it can do is it can uh, publish commands uh, nearly simultaneously uh, to all connected listeners. In our model, um, minions then self-select whether or not uh, they should run the command in question. Uh, they immediately fork uh, a new process so that they don't block, do the work that needs to be done, uh, and then reply uh, back over another TCP connection uh, when the work is completed. Now, of course, uh, we can also scale this model out so that it is hierarchical. Uh, we find that uh, that while that gets done, uh, we scale quite well in our default configuration, often up to many thousands of connected nodes onto a single master. Uh, and, and as a result, uh, many of the people who end up uh, scaling into a hierarchical model uh, end up doing so for reasons other than simple simple scaling, uh, which which we're very very proud of. So, what are some of those reasons why, if it's not for scaling, what, why would someone want to do that? Uh, often, we find that uh, that they do that so that they can uh, segment, uh, they can make logical uh, segmentations for access control or for security. Uh, versus simple raw scaling uh, because the message bus underneath is so fast that they find that they don't need to. Um, the secondary reason is that uh, uh, most of the scaling problem we end returns uh, when they come back. Um, and so at times um, uh, it, we can see occasionally a thundering herd problem uh, handling those returns. But again, we usually don't run into that on the master side uh, until many thousands uh, of returns uh, being handled at once. Uh, we use uh, on the master uh, a, a router dealer pattern in 0MQ so that we can spin up uh, many backend processes and simply forward the work off to them and continue to have a, a high-speed listener uh, to come in and, and listen to the received events and then, like I said, forward them to a queue uh, on the back end to be processing, to be processed rather. Uh, SALT is designed to be uh, highly asynchronous uh, at every step of the way. Uh, and so we, we work very, very hard to avoid blocking operations anywhere in the architecture. So th this is kind of interesting because I'm thinking about the way I've ran HPC systems for you know a decade plus. And normally I'm not that worried about the performance of my provisioning and configuration management system, except when loading the cluster, which is only every so often. So you run into cloud world. I'm guessing the entire model in which people normally operate their environment around salt stack is different than what I'm used to. Can you describe the way people normally use this and why they would need this performance? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and it's one of the points that we try and drive home, which is that um, we feel like SaltStack, instead of being a pure configuration management system, uh, is a, a high-speed uh, event bus upon which configuration management is only one service. Uh, we find that in many infrastructures, people end up uh, building their own messaging buses. Of course, this is really common uh, in the HPC world, for example. Uh, and they build those messaging buses to uh, connect applications together, to connect applications to systems, to what have you. Uh, we see this vision as, as something that we call event-driven infrastructure. Uh, and event-driven infrastructure is this idea that if you have a high-speed event bus uh, connecting all of your systems and applications together, uh, that you can make the uh, data that's ingested and broadcast onto that bus uh, fairly, you can make all of that data a first class citizen, whether that data comes from uh, kernel messages or, that are being emitted, or whether that data uh, comes from uh, monitoring high up in your application stack. Um, because you have this, uh, this high-speed event bus, you can uh, use that data and you can program against that data, i.e. you can watch uh, events coming in from your application stack uh, and use the configuration management engine as a service to, let's say, tune your kernel, for example. Uh, and so uh, putting all of that data on a single plane uh, with a configuration management service that can be reactive to that data, uh, we think is what allows people to, to build really, really interesting next generation, uh, highly scalable, highly flexible, highly reactive and reflexive systems. 
Okay, so this is why you see this is built with like the cloud because you're kind of dynamically provisioning and spinning stuff up as needed. Sure, auto scaling is is certainly one component of that, and we get people uh, doing things like that quite frequently. Uh, but it even comes into play in smaller cases. Say, for example, uh, continuous integration, uh, where people. Uh, have points in their process um, that are, are blocking, right? So let's say, for example, uh, you know, a very typical continuous integration workflow might be check in code, then wait until the tests are run, and then if the tests pass, go out and provision things into a staging environment, right? Uh, most people sort of tend that tend to glue those pieces together. Um, they have to glue their uh, you know test framework into their you know code deployment framework and so on and so forth. Uh, we think that by making all of that event based, right, that uh, it makes all of those pieces easier to work with. All of a sudden, uh, you can simply watch for your uh, test system to say to emit uh, events uh, onto the event bus uh, saying that the tests have passed and then your configuration management piece can take over uh, and start to deploy that code as needed, so on and so forth. So on your website, it says that, uh, and I'm going to quote here too, uh, Salt Stack is orchestration and automation software for cloud ops, IT ops, and DevOps. And, and I think I can grok you know, what you've been saying here over the last several minutes into that. But could you define what you mean by that and possibly even define what you mean by those three terms there? Sure. Um, when we talk about uh, IT ops, we're talking about uh, traditional IT operations. And, uh, you know, I think one of the things that, that we say to ourselves sort of day to day um, you know, we obviously uh, we're very much in the DevOps space, and I say DevOps kind of with quotes around it because uh, uh, you know DevOps is uh, is is a term that is is increase is growing every day, and it seems to encompass more and more uh, more and more things every time you turn around. Uh, you know, and SaltStack is very much uh, in defense of the sysadmin. Uh, we're very much. Uh, supportive of this idea that uh, that you know while DevOps uh, has its place and that place is very important, trying to connect devs teams to ops teams, there are still a lot of guys out there just doing traditional system administration, and they still need uh, you know really good tools to do that. Uh, and so we don't want to shirk away uh, from the sorts of problems that those guys face day to day. Uh, so anyway, that's what we would call IT ops. Of course, cloud ops, you know, we uh, guys who are provisioning uh, stuff either in public or private clouds uh, who need to deal, you know, with auto scaling problems, who need to be able to understand, you know, what their cost metrics might look like uh, and who need to build uh, systems that uh, – uh, can dynamically uh, provision themselves and can uh, can have configuration, of course, laid on top of them after um, you know just the, the the regular cloud instances are provisioned. And uh, you know, DevOps, of course, is the last piece. You know, we see uh, we see DevOps, you know, very much in terms of uh, of the original vision uh, that was laid out, you know, by by John Alspa and those folks in in two thousand nine when they spoke of velocity. Uh, and talked about this idea that, of course, there is this common language that can be shared between devs, dev teams and ops teams. Uh, our stance has always been that um, we need to be able to connect dev and ops, but we don't want to dumb down either side. Uh, and so when we come at DevOps, we try to come at it um, not by creating this common language that's so abstract and so simple um, that uh, it doesn't provide enough power for either side, uh, but by doing everything we can uh, to speak to, to both sides and voices that they can understand. So I went to a meetup just last week where they were demonstrating SALT, and they were running on a bunch of machines that were running on the AWS cloud. But when they were doing things, they were running on already running minions, and it really just looked like another configuration, push out a patch, install some package on these class of machines. Mm -hmm. uh, they use pillar to put in dynamic data and things like that. What mm -hmm. I want to know more about is, is when you say cloud integration and cloud ops, and mm -hmm. what exactly does that get down into meaning? Sure. So 
Normally, when we talk about that, uh, we talk about uh, our Salt Cloud product. And uh, Salt Cloud is a cloud provisioner. So it allows you to make maps, um, uh, let's say, uh, with your AWS credentials and your Linode credentials and what have you. Uh, and then uh, spin up machines, um, you know, of a given size or or with given uh, resource parameters uh, across um, a single or multiple cloud providers. Uh, bootstrap them uh, with salt uh, if desired, and then bring them up uh, in, into their intended role uh, so that they can be uh, ready to be inserted into into a production environment. Uh, so really, it's that uh, it, it's the step all the way from uh, deciding, you know, which which clouds, be it pri- uh, public or private or what have you, uh, all the way through the instance provisioning step, and then through the uh, configuration management provisioning step, uh, and then of course configuration management uh, or in su- general systems management can take over uh, to turn that node in, into something into whatever it is that you need it to be. Okay, so I, I think Brock and I are probably having a, a little hard time wrapping our heads around this because, like, as he said, this is this is very different than what we do. So it's it's against our yeah. bias, but it, it seems like these are kind of you're aiming at different types of applications than than we traditionally do. So something mm-hmm. that that is uh, more in terms of well, I hate to use this word because we've already used it several times already, but dynamic, right? That I want to mm-hmm. start a service, do some things, take it down, and then do some other things, and potentially be reusing resources with the next service that I start up and whatnot. And so it's much more involved with uh, creating and destroying individual elements that can be used to service uh, different actions that might be occurring in either a pipeline or some kind of parallel pipeline or many simultaneous pipelines and and, and things like that. Um, Is that a little more accurate than what what Brock and I might be thinking that, you know, I I really love the idea of how you explain that the the provisioning side is, is programmatic, or at least that's how I, I grokked what you said, that I can sure. write code that says, okay, now spin up this and I'll get back, you know, did that work, did that not fail, or what other fine-grained yeah. kind of results I might get from that. Sorry, that was a, a big blob of a question there. I yeah. hope that made some yeah. sense. Yeah, um, I'll, 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 I'll try and, uh, and respond to it as best I can. I think that um, there are a couple things to say about it. Um, one is that... Um, one of the things that, that I see personally is that the configuration management space uh, is starting to split down the middle a little bit. Um, there are uh, some tools which are very, very focused on the provisioning side, right? Like, what does it take to get this machine either from bare metal or from uh, a stock OS uh, provisioned with uh, the intended packages and configuration files and what have you inst- uh, installed? Uh, and of course, you know that becomes more and more popular uh, as containerization takes hold, right? Uh, you know, and people talk, uh, uh, of course, about immutable infrastructure, right? This idea that you provision it, right, and then once it's provisioned, uh, it doesn't change, right? Uh, or at least that's the theory. Um, but of course, anybody who's managed systems knows that uh, that systems have a real life cycle. Uh, and that life cycle goes beyond uh, simply standing up the machine and provisioning it and putting it into production. Uh, that you have to deal with things like you know security patches, for example, day to day, with you know configuration drift, bit rot, uh, all the things that, uh, that that cause systems to uh, uh, to well to to misbehave over time. You know, disks filling up, what have you, um, and so you know. We, we try to stand on both sides of that divide. Of course, you know, uh, Salt Cloud and, uh, uh, you know, does a very, very good job in the, in the provisioning side. Uh, but Salt, the configuration management engine, uh, you know, along with uh, the agents that are running on these machines, can allow you to manage the full life cycle of the machine beyond simply provisioning um, and uh, be able to, to use it and manage it day to day. So... Do you work with like native package managers and stuff like that when you get down to the mm-hmm. configuration management part or and then okay if you do work with native package managers <coughs> do I have to know anything about those package managers if I say run some Red Hat and some Ubuntu machines and to use two different package systems Right 
Um, we do abstract away uh, most of the differences between the various package managers. Uh, so, for example, with Salt, uh, if you want to install Vim, right, it's package.install Vim. And whether it's uh, RPM or dpackage or whatever it is under the hood, uh, we'll figure that out for you and we'll end up, you know, shelling out to the correct commands. Uh, that does not, however, account for the differences in package naming. Um, and so a very common example is that some distributions name Apache Apache 2, where other distributions uh, might name their packages HTTPD. Uh, we do not abstract away those differences uh, simply because uh, the risks of doing so uh, are a little bit high, <laughs> right? Uh, you only want to abstract package management so far. Uh, and so we allow for those differences um, by allowing people in their um, configuration files with salt that declare the intended state of a system, um, those are normally written uh, in YAML, right? They're, they're simply data structures. Uh, but we also allow people to interpolate Jinja so they can say, for example, if this is a Red Hat system, install the package uh, Apache 2. If this is a uh, Ubuntu system, install the package HTTPD, what have you. I may have reversed those. I don't remember which is which off the top of my head, but I think you get the idea. All right. Now, you said something interesting in there, too. You said, uh, I think you said salt.install in, in a package name. Were you referring to a particular language binding? Is, is there a preferred language that uh, your, your users use? Right. So when they're using the, the salt's configuration management engine, uh, they declare um, the states of their systems and the language in which they make those declarations by default is YAML uh, with, uh, with some Jinja interpolation if they wish to do so. Uh, however, SALT fundamentally is agnostic uh, about the way that uh, those data structures are declared because we ingest them as native Python data structures which is to say whether you want to use uh, YAML and uh, Jinja uh, or any other templating language, I mean, you know, XML, if, if you're, <laughs> that's really what you want to do, um, so long as it can get rendered down to a Python data structure, we're good with it. They could come from an external source uh, as, as far as we're concerned. Uh, and so uh, we're, we're effectively language agnostic, so long as... Uh, they get rendered down to Python data structures that we can understand, uh, which is great because uh, it allows people to use the syntax that they would really like to use. Some people like YAML, some people don't, and that's completely fine with us. So <clears throat> one of the issues I run into a lot of times with these configuration systems is, okay, it's easy for me to install an RPM, but RPMs don't come with the correct config files for that specific host that's providing that specific need. How do you handle sure. like, okay, once you've installed a, you know, HTTPD, how do mm -hmm. I get the right, you know, virtualhost.conf onto that node that's supposed to serve that one? Right. Um, so the, the standard way to do that is to declare one state, which is to install the package and then a second state to lay down a configuration file, excuse me, to lay down a configuration file uh, needed uh, for uh, the package that you've just installed, right? i.e. your customized uh, configuration file. Uh, Salt in its uh, state system has uh, a set of requisites which can do things like, say, um, first install the package and then lay down the configuration file, because obviously doing those things in the correct order uh, very much matters. Can it even go a step beyond that? Like if you're looking at an application level, mm -hmm. say I'm adding more HTTP servers to serve a very busy site, can it also then tell the elastic load balancer to add this extra machine to the round robin? Absolutely. Uh, and so what it can do is um, it, can, uh, it, can, it can create um, those Apache configs, right? Uh, and then we have requisites that say, for example, uh, watch to see 
if on this given state run, we have added uh, an additional V host. And if we have uh, bump the load balancers uh, or configure more machines or what have you. Uh, so that requisite system uh, allows people uh, to create uh, stateful relationships that are actually associated uh, with their deployment workflows. So you just mentioned some very interesting hooks there. Do you yeah. also have hooks down at – Say the hardware level too. I, I know you say you concentrate a lot more on 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 uh, virtual machines and hypervisors and mm -hmm. containers and things, but do you have thing hooks into say IPMI and or other BMC or or bare metal kinds of things as well? You know, we just put uh, an IPMI uh, module into uh, our develop branch. I don't recall off the top of my head whether that is going into our release, which is going out the door in a few days. Uh, but if not, because Salt is is very very modular, there's uh, it's quite simple to just pluck a module off the develop branch and, and use it uh, on your local system. Uh, BMC, I do not recall support for, uh, but uh, I know that IPMI is definitely in. So, uh, what if I wanted to add support to this? What's uh, Salt written in? You've mentioned Python a couple yep. of times. I'm assuming that's what it is. That is correct. Um, it is written in Python. Um, uh, creating uh, modules uh, is actually quite easy. Uh, it's uh, uh, so what we have is we have this idea of execution modules, right? So an execution module uh, is a is a collection uh, of uh, similar routines, right? So for example, uh, let's say package.install, package.remove, package.upgrade, for example. Um, and so let's say uh, you wanted to uh, build out uh, additional support for kernel tuning, right? Which is there right now, but let's say you wanted to add some additional functionality. Uh, you could uh, do, uh, you know, sysctl, uh, you could uh, simply drop in a new function called uh, IP forward, right? And what that would do uh, would be to, say, say, turn on IP forwarding for the kernel. Um, doing that is, is really just uh, a, a matter of uh, writing Python code uh, to do what you want on the system. The really nice thing about that is that when you are uh, writing that Python code, uh, you already have access to all of the other salt execution modules in that namespace. So you don't have to re-implement uh, all the details of shelling out, for example, to run a particular command and avoiding shell injection and all of that. Uh, so you can actually use all of the other execution modules in your development. Um, and because you can do that, uh, writing new execution modules becomes really, really easy because you have access uh, to all of the execution modules that have already been written. So just out of curiosity, since I'm a, mm -hmm. a developer myself, it's, it's something uh -huh. I like to ask other developer crews. Sure. What uh, version control system do you use and why? We uh, are an open source project uh, and uh, we are hosted on GitHub. Uh, so uh, we've been very, very happy uh, with GitHub. Uh, they, are, uh, they are very kind to allow us to, uh, to use and abuse uh, their machines. Uh, we do we do quite a lot of traffic uh, on GitHub, and uh, and we've been very very happy with what they've done uh, for us. And uh, every time we see those guys, we we try to gush and go out of our way to really thank them because they do really really wonderful work. So I, I I'm going to ask our usual what's the largest question, and, and for our high performance mm -hmm. computing people, it normally means what's the largest cluster, what's the largest number of machines. But I'm thinking mm -hmm. there's a couple of different ways you could slice this for. Salt. So first, sure. what's the largest number of machines that's been mm -hmm. managed? But then also, what's the largest number of, say, unique configurations it's ever dealt with? Yeah. Um, the largest number of machines that we know of uh, is in the many tens of thousands. Uh, we have large companies uh, like LinkedIn, for an example. Uh, they manage many tens of thousands of machines. Uh, and uh, and the great thing is that they do it uh, on uh, uh, you know reasonably sized hardware. You know they don't have an entire rack of salt masters, for example, uh, to do this. Um, to the best of my uh, knowledge, uh, they have one 
uh, big salt master uh, that's something like 16 cores, um, and uh, and they have many tens of thousands of machines. Uh, and there are a number of installations. They're not the only ones uh, that are that are running at that scale. Uh, so it's it's really not uncommon uh, for us to 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 scale up there. And that said, we have a lot of installations that are, um, you know. A few machines, a couple of machines, a dozen machines, what have you. So it's really all over the map. So let me ask you a slightly different spin yeah. on that. Mm -hmm. What is the most unique usage of SaltStack that you've heard? Perhaps something that you, are, you, you look at and you go, wow, I, I never even would have thought yeah. to use SaltStack that way. <laughs> yeah. Um, we, we, ha we just had our, our user conference and... Um, uh, we had a, a, a guy submit uh, a proposal for us about uh, how he's using uh, salt in sub-Saharan Africa, and uh, it was uh, it was a wonderful talk. I, I believe it will be on our YouTube channel uh, soon. Um, I know that there have been some uses in Africa. Uh, they've uh, they've used it to to rapidly provision uh, machines uh, to respond to the Ebola crisis there. Uh, I have also uh, talked to some folks uh, also uh, from Africa uh, who have used salt to uh, to manage uh, remote machines that are off uh, in um, in very remote locations, be it in small African villages or what have you, uh, where they need basically machines that they can leave alone and not touch for six months uh, and ensure that they are going to continue to run and that everything will be happy. Uh, and that uh, when they are contacted, that they can use a very lightweight, uh, uh, quick to respond uh, uh, remote execution uh, platform. Uh, so yeah, so I, I think the uh, the uh, machines in remote African villages is probably our most surprising use case. So you mentioned it's an open source project. Specifically, what license is Salt distributed under? It's distributed under the Apache license. Okay, and then so finally, where can people get involved and find more information about SaltStack? Sure, the best place to uh, to come is to uh, uh, our GitHub page uh, on our GitHub page, which is github.com slash saltstack slash salt. Uh, they'll see links, of course, uh, to very typical open source project uh, things like our mailing list and our, our, our IRC channel. Uh, we have many hundreds of people uh, in the IRC channel, and it's very, very easy uh, to get involved there. Uh, we, uh, we have a very, very active developer community, and uh, it's, it's quite simple uh, to uh, submit patches uh, or feature requests or what have you. Uh, we do tend to pride ourselves uh, on the quickness of response uh, for the uh, the bug reports and the uh, the um, patches that we get. Uh, so it's it's very very common for people to submit patches to us and see them merged into Salt uh, either in a couple of minutes uh, and usually at the most, frankly, an hour or two uh, is is a very typical turnaround for us to to get code that's been submitted to us into the code base. Okay, so you, uh, open source is great, um, but uh, a traditional thing that you hear and, and not everybody understands is that it is still possible to have a successful business model even with open source software, even though you're giving away the goods, so to speak. This is something that I hear uh, a lot. Um, so what is, what is your business model? How do you guys you know, put food on the table? Right. Uh, we do that in a couple of different ways. Um, uh, and the first thing to say about this is that uh, – uh, Tom Hatch, our, our CTO, gave uh, a wonderful keynote address uh, that I think uh, extends far outside of SaltStack uh, about how open source businesses uh, can make money. Uh, I expect that by the time this recording is posted, that should be up on the SaltStack YouTube channel. Uh, and I really encourage anybody who's interested in how open source companies uh, can make money uh, to go and watch that. The second thing to say is that Salt is not open core uh, and that we have absolutely no plans to be open core. Uh, we do have uh, proprietary software. Uh, the proprietary software that we sell uh, is in the form of a management GUI, uh, which uh, just got released uh, last month. And uh, it's, a, it's a management GUI that allows you to bring a lot of the uh, you know, admittedly abstract uh, concepts into 
uh, a very nice, clean web interface and and manage your systems uh, in a way that uh, you know the entire breadth of an IT staff uh, can understand. Uh, and so there's been tremendous interest uh, in that as a product. Of course, uh, we also go out and we uh, we offer trainings. Uh, we do a lot of integration work, and of course, uh, we sell many, many, many uh, support contracts for. Uh, uh, larger installations uh, that are interested in, uh, uh, in in having developer support. So, what's coming to future versions of SaltStack? You've mentioned a couple of things. What what do you think are the important bits coming? Right, uh, the stuff that we've been working on um, recently, we've been very very excited about. Uh, we've just released uh, two new features uh, that we call engines and beacons. Uh, I have mentioned a couple of times this this high speed event bus that we have that allows you to uh, uh, to have this singular uh, message transport uh, for events whether they originate you know from the operating system or from uh, the application uh, and so uh, beacons are uh, a technology that allows you uh, on the uh, salt minion to effectively uh, monitor certain uh, events on that, uh, uh, on, on that minion. Uh, for example, iNotify is one of the beacons that we just wrote. So you can watch a particular file or directory, and if there are changes to that directory, an event will be emitted onto the event bus, which can then be programmatically responded to um, or simply logged for auditing or what have you. The other side of that coin uh, is engines. Uh, engines uh, are processes which run on the salt master. Uh, again, that's the, the command side of our command and control model. And uh, engines allow you to uh, to watch uh, that event bus uh, and uh, do whatever you like with events that you see. Um, and so uh, it gives you tremendous flex flexibility because all you have to do is watch for events on the wire uh, and then write whatever Python you like uh, to go out and respond to that, be it, uh, you know, uh, using configuration management to go back and uh, uh, make changes on your system in response to events, uh, whether it's alerting, whether it's uh, uh, simply notification, uh, or whether it's just logging uh, for an audit trail. Uh, engines really allow you to take this idea of an event-driven infrastructure uh, and allow you to actually sit down and write code uh, to to respond to those events. Uh, so we're very, very excited uh, about that technology. Uh, of course, we're going to continue to develop uh, RATE, which is, uh, like I said, the reliable asynchronous event transport uh, that we believe is going to give us even more flexibility uh, in the future. Uh, because um, uh, while zero MQ has been really, really wonderful for us, uh, we've reached a point where uh, we want to be able to do some things that zero MQ uh, really um, doesn't make it as easy as as we would like. Uh, and so we're very excited. We're going to continue to do a lot of development uh, in that area. And of course, uh, the last thing to say is that uh, we're working very, very hard uh, onto our uh, our enterprise GUI uh, and. Uh, and uh, trying to make sure that that's as good as it can be. So those are all things that we're going to be very focused on in the coming months. Mike, thanks a lot for your time. Uh, again, what's a place where people can find more information about SaltStack? Uh, either saltstack.com or our GitHub page, github.com slash saltstack slash salt. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Mike. Great. That was good fun.